Okay, so we spent the first unit of this particular course, Chem 1A, talking about the properties of atoms and how the periodic table arranges them so that their properties can be predicted, things like ionization energies, electron affinities. Now, we saw a, a slight example at the very end of this last unit that when you have elemental matter, which is made of atoms, things like gold, copper, hydrogen, any element on the periodic table, that some of those, those, ad, those elements do not exist as individual atoms in reality. If you have a tank of hydrogen gas, those aren't millions and millions of hydrogen atoms. Those are diatomic hydrogen molecules. Crystals of sulfur exist as S8 sulfur ringed molecules. The atoms are undergoing some type of attraction where they hold together as some larger unit than an atom, and that's called chemical bonding. And in fact, when you look at around at nature, and you look at all the matter that exists, the water, the dirt, the air, whatever it is, it turns out that almost all matter is not just made up of individual atoms. The atoms are somehow combining in order to hook together to make larger units. And that's because individual atoms, essentially, except for the noble gases, do not have, complete, do not have complete outer shells. They have incomplete outer shells. And the incomplete outer shells, although that's not necessarily a bad situation, they lend themselves to actually undergoing change. And we've seen two types of elements on the periodic table, right? We've seen metallic elements, which are the big ones on the bottom left-hand corner. What's significant about being a big atom? Well, you have a lot of shielding and the outer shell electrons are held really loosely. So that means the electrons can be released easily. So these can actually change their configuration by losing their outer shell electrons and therefore getting a complete outer shell in the next lowest energy level. If you're a small atom in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table, you don't have very much shielding. So if electrons flying by you, it can be attracted by that nucleus and suck in, and you actually can gain electrons, and you could actually continue to gain electrons until you have a complete outer shell. And as we saw in our activity today, why, why do you stop there? Because once you have a complete outer shell, any more electrons you gain would have to go into a higher energy level and that's not going to be stable. So we'll find that anything you're looking at around you, once again, whether it's water, whether it's sand, whether it's dirt, whether it's plastic, whatever the material is, it's probably not really made up of atoms that have these incomplete outer shells, which we've spent a lot of time expressing this first unit. You have to draw dot structures of an aluminum atom or dot structures of an oxygen atom. But that's really not how matter exists. When you have that incomplete outer shell, the atoms become reactive, as we said, because either they have low ionization energies, those are the metals, or they have high or very exothermic, I should say, really, electron affinities, those are the nonmetals. These cause the elements susceptible to changing their valence electrons, and that's what quite often they do until they form something that's more stable. So essentially what atoms do is they bond together in order to create stable, complete outer shells. And once again, staying clear of something like personification, we do not say atoms bond to become happy. They don't, aren't happy, they aren't glad that they're changing their outer shell electron arrangement to be similar to a noble gas, which is a complete outer shell called an octet. They aren't doing it for that reason. It's they become more stable, their energy state gets lowered when they do that because the metals wind up being more stable when they release their valence electrons. And then the non-metals become more stable when they gain excess valence electrons, okay? So when we use the word bond, a bond denotes something that holds things together, like glue bonds to broken pieces of a cup together, right? So a chemical bond is something that holds atoms together. And the reason it holds atoms together into some other unit we call a molecule is it's an electrostatic attraction. There's some positive negative attraction going on here and the positive and negative attraction holds this unit together, holds the atoms next to each other. An individual atom is held together by electrostatic attraction. The nucleus is positive, the electrons are negative. That's why the electrons stay in the atom. But now if two atoms bond together, there's gonna to be some type of electrostatic attraction that keeps the atoms next to each other, and we call that a chemical bond. Now, the type of chemical bond that occurs between atoms depends upon what type of atoms are coming together and attempting to bond. So the first type would be, what if you have metals? You put a whole bunch of metal atoms together. Let's say you put a million gold atoms together, or you put a million iron atoms together. 
or you have a mixture of metal, maybe copper and tin or copper and tin and zinc, and you mix them together forming brass or bronze. These substances are solids and to an observer, if you have something that's a solid, that means there's something causing those atoms to stick together. Otherwise it wouldn't be a solid. It would turn into a gas. All the atoms would separate from each other. So the fact that we have matter that exists in the solid state is evidence that somehow these atoms are sticking together, are chemically bonding. And if the atoms happen to be metals, the type of bonding they undergo is metallic bonding, and that's the first type we're going to discuss today. If the types of atoms that are coming together are metals and nonmetals, then you're going to have a different type of bonding. If metals and nonmetals come together, and that would be something like the metal sodium and the nonmetal chlorine, they can actually bond together and they form a compound between the two, formula NaCl, named sodium chloride, and this has a different type of bonding than metallic bonding. This is called ionic bonding. We'll discuss that second. And then finally, and this will really be the, the major thrust of this entire second unit now of the semester, is we're going to talk about what happens when nonmetal atoms come together. And when nonmetal atoms come together, they can hook to form these small little units. H2 means two hydrogen atoms somehow bonded together. S8 is eight sulfur atoms somehow bonded together. H2O is three atoms bonded together, C8H1826 atoms somehow bonded together. When nonmetals bond, they undergo a type of bonding called covalent bonding. So we're going to see if we can introduce each of these today. And then uh, starting next week, we'll go into more detail about chemical bonding. So let's talk about metals first. <clears throat> first person to try to describe the type of bonding that metals undergo was Arnold Sommerfeld, and this was in the early 1900s, 1904. And Sommerfeld realizing that metals have low ionization energies. When you put a bunch of metal atoms together, he thought, what if the valence electrons in those metals somehow break away from the individual atoms? And those valence electrons migrate around all the metal nuclei. Well, the electrons are negative, the nuclei are positive. Maybe those free floating electrons might be an attractive force to hold all the nuclei together as a solid unit. So he proposed that metal atoms release their valence electrons and they wind up sharing them between large numbers of metal atoms because the valence electrons are negative. Every single metal atom has a positive nucleus. And so maybe this valence electron cloud that's created will attract all the nuclei and the entire chunk of metal is held together. So that's some electrostatic attraction between the negative electrons and all the positive nuclei. And so this is a chemical bond, an electrostatic attraction. And we call this a metallic bond. So a metallic bond, according to Sommerfeld, we still believe this true today, is the electrostatic attraction of these shared valence electrons and the nuclei of the many bonding metal atoms. So it's the electrostatic attraction of the shared valence electrons to the nuclei of the many bonding metallic atoms. And if we look at a picture of what this would look like, if you put a whole bunch of metal atoms together, and what I have here is I try to have the nucleus drawn, or actually there's the atom, it's in blue, and the nucleus is in the center, so I'm just putting a positive sign in there. And every single atom has some valence electrons, which would be in the outer shell. So I'm going to draw those valence electrons in orangish yellow. And if the atoms have low ionization energies for those valence electrons, maybe those electrons will not stick near their own individual atom, but they'll break away and they'll start floating around all of the atoms. It's like, you know, you're like keeping your dog in your house, right? But if you open the door, what's the dog going to do? He's going to run around to all the houses in the neighborhood. And the electrons would do the same thing. If they do, these electrons are going to wind up making a swarm or a cloud of negatively charged electrons that are migrating all around these atoms, attracting to all the positive nuclei. And that overall attraction between this valence electron cloud or swarm and the nuclei of all those atoms is what holds a chunk of metal together. So when metallic bonding exists, when metal atoms come together, Metallic bonding forms what we call a crystalline network. A network just means uh, a similar pattern repeating over and over again, and it's really, really big. So it's like these atoms with their valence electron clouds over and over and over again until you get to the extremity of the piece of metal. So this forms crystalline networks 
containing billions of metal atoms that are strongly attracted to each other, okay? And we believe any metal is bonded together this way. Now, those metal atoms can be all 100% gold atoms. They could all be 100% copper atoms. If it is, we have a pure elemental metal. But brass and bronze are also metallic substances. They're just made up of a mixture of metals, of copper, of tin, of zinc. Now, when you create a mixture of metals, the proportion of the copper and the zinc and the tin doesn't matter. You can mix 50% copper and 50% tin, or 40% copper, 60% tin. The ratio is variable. And if you think back to the first day of the semester when we talked about what is a compound, a compound is something that if you decompose it, it has a definite proportion. It always has the same percentages of the elements by mass. That's the definition of a compound. So when you form something like brass or bronze, it's not a compound. It's just a simple mixture. A mixture can be thrown together with components in any proportions. And that's what happens when you mix metals together. We actually have a name for them. They're called alloys but they are not compounds. So metallic bonding does not produce, produce unique compounds, but it can predict, produce mixtures of different metals, which we call alloys, okay? And in, in, when all is said is done, that's how we actually believe any metallic substance is bonded together. Professor, would that mean that alloys are stronger than the original element? No, I didn't say they're necessarily stronger. It's just that <clears throat> an alloy is a mixture of metals. So if you have just pure copper, that's just an elemental metal. But if you have copper mixed with a little bit of gold, then you might have, well, it'd be gold mixed with a little bit of copper. You'd have rose gold. Maybe harder, may not. Depends upon the properties of the two individual metals. But the, the uh, point I'm making is if you mix copper and gold together to make rose gold, can you call that a compound? And it's not. It's really just a mixture because the amount of copper and gold you mix together can vary. So metallic bonding doesn't produce unique compounds. It just produces mixtures if you're mixing different elemental metals together. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay. Now, what if metal atoms and non-metal atoms approach each other and they attempt to bond? Well, how metals and non-metals attempt to bond was recognized, it was the same year, 1904, by Richard Abegg, where he proposed that atoms will gain or lose their valence electrons to achieve the electron configurations of noble gases. We've spent the last day or so in this class just talking about, gee, when you get to the noble gas configuration, guess what? It's too hard to lose an electron from that. It's too hard to gain an electron from that. So it looks like if atoms reach that configuration, they're probably gonna be stable. The ionization energies allow metals to lose all their valence electrons. And then when they get to the noble gas, the ionization energies get really, really high. So you can't lose any more. When nonmetals gain electrons, they have exothermic electron affinities until they get to a noble gas configuration. And then the noble gas configuration has an electron affinity of zero, so it won't gain anymore. So mathematically, or actually experimentally from data on ionization energies and electron affinities, we can understand that once you get to a noble gas configuration, the newly created ion is now sort of stuck. We like saying it's stable because that's a better connotation to it but they really get stuck in that position. And Abeg said, I bet that's what metals and nonmetals do when they react. Now, metals, as we've learned in our first unit, and this will be on your test eventually, our first test, is that metal atoms easily lose their valence electrons because they have low ionization energies for their valence electrons. And so because they lose negatively charged electrons, they form positive ions. And if we want to talk about what kind of positive ion will be created, you can quite often tell that by looking at how many valence electrons the atom has. And we recognize that it's the valence electrons that have low ionization energies, so they'll be lost. So for an aluminum atom, whose 13 electrons are spread out over these sublevels, there are three electrons in the third energy level. So those three electrons would be expected to have very low ionization energies. And after they're pulled off, any additional electrons trying to be removed would have to come from the second energy level, and that's way closer to the nucleus. That's going to be a huge amount of energy, so those don't get lost. So aluminum will only form the 3s2 and the 3p1. That's three electrons lost, three less negative charges, so that means we would predict aluminum would form a positive 3 ion. And when it does, now it has the same configuration as a noble gas. This happens to be similar to the noble gas neon. 
Why does it stop there again? Because you can't pull any more electrons out. The energy to do that's way too high. So for most elements, and especially if they're in the S or P section, you can predict exactly what ion charge the metal is going to form by just realizing it's going to lose each of its valence electrons. When you're in the transition section, we can't do it as easily because not only do the valence electrons have low ionization energies, but sometimes the next sublevel, the D sublevel, which is not quite the valence shell, it's one below, sometimes they have low ionization energies as well. And the significance of this is elements like iron, which is a transition metal, could just lose the 4s electrons and make a positive 2 ion, or it could lose the 4s electrons and some of the d electrons to make other charges as well. I just stated something that wasn't intuitively obvious to start with, so let me say that again now. When you take an iron atom and you're going to start removing electrons from it, the lowest ionization are always the valence electrons. Those are the ones that get removed. It's a little counterintuitive here because what was the last thing we wrote down in the iron configuration? 3d6. So you might think the 3d electrons would be the ones that would be pulled off first, but it is not the case. And this is very similar to, as we talked about once a little bit earlier this week, playing basketball. And if you're on offense in basketball, you're holding the ball, you take that ball and you hold it under your chin because the closer the ball is to you, the harder it is to steal it. The more you hold the ball out in front of you, the easier it is to steal. So if you can just picture the electrons in a 4s orbital and a 3d orbital, and this may be something I may ask you to draw on the test, what's the difference between a 4s orbital and a 3d orbital? 4s orbital is round, 3d orbital is four-leaf clover shaped, but the energy levels are different. The 4s orbital is really, really big. 3d orbital is small. So because that 4s orbital is really big, the electron is far away from the nucleus, like holding the basketball out like this. So if something's going to come up and attract an electron away from an iron atom, it's not going to reach into the atom and pull out that 3D electron, which is close to the nucleus. It's going to take the electron on the outside. That's the 4S. So anytime you have a transition metal, important to know, the first electrons ever pulled off are always the valence electrons, not the ones that were filled last, not those 3Ds. So iron could form a positive 2 ion if it loses those two 4s electrons. It would have a configuration now of argon in brackets, 3d6. But there are situations where some of the 3d electrons may have low ionization energies as well. And for iron, one of the 3d electrons actually has a fairly low ionization energy. It can be pulled out. And if it is, iron would then form a positive 3 ion with the configuration argon in brackets, 3d5. So in the transition block and the inner transition block, you actually can't predict the exact charge of an iron ion because it can form several different ion charges. But if they tell you the ion charge that's created and you want to draw the electron configuration for that, always remember it's the valence electrons that get pulled off first. And then if any additional electrons are going to be removed, those are going to be ones coming from the next sublevel after that, which would be the 3Ds in this case. So metals always form positive ions by losing their valence electrons. Nonmetals wind up forming negative ions by gaining electrons. So nonmetals will gain electrons to their valence shells, forming negative ions. And if we take an example of a nonmetal, something like oxygen, and just write the electron configuration notation for oxygen, which would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, oxygen being a nonmetal has a very exothermic electron affinity. It will attract an electron. If it does, it'll go to 2p5, and it'll now have a negative one charge. But it still has one more spot in the 2p sublevel. And so the next electron will be exothermically attracted as well, and then it'll get to 2p6, and then it has a configuration of a noble gas with a charge of negative two. Once it reaches that noble gas configuration, it can't gain another electron because the next electron would go into the third energy level, wouldn't be stable, wouldn't attract the nucleus, wouldn't release energy, so that doesn't happen. So you can actually then easily predict what ion charge nonmetals are going to form, first realizing they gain electrons. They'll gain enough until they reach an, a noble gas configuration. Oxygen will gain two electrons until it goes to 2p6. Its charge is now negative two. And you could say it's stable at this point, or you could say it's stuck at this point. But once it's gained those electrons, you can't add any extra electrons to it. And all the electrons that are in there are held so tightly, ionization energies are really high, it's not going to lose any. So oxygen either gets stuck or is really stable once it forms the O2 minus ion. 
So when aluminum forms its positive three state, or iron forms its positive two or positive three state, or oxygen forms its negative two state, where they all essentially have this noble gas type of configuration, that configuration has really high ionization energies. You can't pull electrons off of them. They do not have exothermic electron affinities. You can't add electrons. So once these ions are formed, these ions are now very stable. Another way to say that is they're unreactive. <coughs> So in the lab today, you saw a video of sodium and somebody threw sodium in water and it blew up, right? Sodium blows up in water because a chunk of sodium metal has a lot of sodium atoms with one valence electron. But if you had sodium ions and you threw them in water, nothing would happen because sodium ions have lost their one electron. They're now Na positive. They have a noble gas configuration and as we stated here at the end, this noble gas configuration is very stable or unreactive. So make sure you see the clear difference between the two. If the atom has incomplete outer shells, it may be a reactive substance. But when it eventually reaches an octet configuration and now changes from an atom into an ion, that's when it's unreactive. Okay, and it's stable. It'll last a long time. Professor? Uh, so I understand why iron could lose the first two electrons yeah. and then drop down, but how is the ionization energy low enough to lose another electron, but no more after that? It turns out if you look at the energy graph of the different sublevels that atoms fill, 1s is the lowest, then 2s, then 2p, then 3s, then 3p, we know the 4s sublevel is the next most stable because it has more penetration of the shielding, then the 3d is a little bit higher. If you look at the energy differences between those, and I never gave you a graph like that, but it is on the book. The 1s and 2s, big energy difference. 2s and 2p, big energy difference. 2p and 3s, big energy difference. 3s and 3p, big energy difference. 3p and 4s, big energy difference, but then the 3d, just slightly higher energy than the 4s. It's not that much of an energy difference. So it'll take a little bit more energy to pull off the d electrons, but not incredibly more. And especially in iron's case, if you see that iron is the sixth element over in the 3d section, that means it has six electrons in its 3D sublevel. What's that sixth electron doing? Can you visualize the five orbitals there? What's that sixth electron doing that might make it have a lower ionization? Oh, so it has electron-electron repulsion. And and that's that's why you can lose that electron. So the, the different um, transition metals will sometimes have situations like that causing the Ds to be extra reactive or lower ionization energies, and that's why they lose those as well. But okay. the general statement is that, that really the 3D sublevel is not that much higher than the 4S, so it doesn't take much more energy to cause those electrons to be removed. Thank you. Okay. So what ABEG said was that when you put metals and nonmetals together, if they turn into ions, which are going to be stable, you're going to have a positive ion and a negative ion. And guess what positive and negatives do? They retract each other because they're oppositely charged. So an ionic bond is just what we call the electrostatic attraction if somehow you've made a positive ion and a negative ion. And so if metals lose their electrons to become positive, and if the nonmetals gain them to become negative, now you're sitting around with a bunch of positive and negative ions, and they're going to naturally attract each other. So a crystal like salt is really just an array of lots and lots of positive sodium ions and lots and lots of negative chloride ions. And the reason this sticks together and makes a solid crystal and the ions don't fly apart from each other is that they're oppositely charged. There's a major attraction between those. So ionic bonding forms crystalline networks, big repeating patterns, containing billions of positive negative ions that are strongly attracted together. What's the difference in the word here I used to describe uh, ionic bonding compared to metallic bonding? Ionic bonding forms networks that have billions of ions. Metallic bonding forms crystalline networks and contain billions of just atoms, okay? So the individual particles in a metallic substance are billions of atoms. It's just they're sharing their valence electrons with each other. But in an ionic compound or something that forms ionic bonding, metals and nonmetals, you actually change the individual particles in the crystal from atoms to ions. They're charged particles that are in there, okay? <clears throat> so ABEG's theory of bonding, it turned out 
was able to explain something that people didn't have an explanation for before, and that was the formulas of ionic compounds. So I want you to watch how successful this is in predicting the correct formulas for ionic compounds, because people could take things like sodium chloride, decompose them, weigh the amount of sodium, weigh the amount of chloride, and they could figure out, I think that compound is one sodium atom or ion to one chloride atom or ion. But do we have a theory to explain why that would be? Okay, well, here's a crisp, some crystals of sodium chloride, okay? If we, draw the Lewis, uh, if we draw the dot notation rather for a sodium atom, and this is a skill you need for the first test, and this is why it's important because we're gonna use it a lot here in the second test. Sodium's in the first column on the periodic table. It has one valence electron. The dot structure would have one dot. Chlorine is in the 17th column on the periodic table. Those elements have seven valence electrons. So the dot notation for chlorine would be Cl with seven dots. If these approach each other, sodium has a low ionization energy. It's easy to pull its electron off and chlorine has a high exothermic electron affinity. If it can take that electron, it's gonna release a lot of energy and be stable. So naturally, if a metal atom and a non-metal atom approach each other, you can have the non-metal atom attract the electron away from the metal atom. And once that electron's been moved, these are not atoms anymore, these are ions. The sodium is now positively charged, and the chloride is now negatively charged, and they're gonna ad naturally attract each other because opposite charges attract. So Abig said, look at this. How many sodiums and chlorines did we need in order to allow the atoms to reach these perfect noble gas configurations? Because if you have eight dots in your dot structure, that's just like a noble gas. What about the sodium? It has no dots. Well, if you have a structure with no dots, that means you've lost your outer shell, so you don't have an octet in the next lowest energy level. So when you're drawing dot structures of ionic compounds, eight dots or zero dots would both represent an octet configuration like a noble gas. So he said, wow, look at that. It only took one sodium and one chlorine to trade one electron to make octets for each. So if pairs of sodium chloride do this over and over and over and over and over, then that means a sodium chloride crystal is just a symmetrical array of billions of sodiums and billions of chlorides, but they have to be in a one-to-one -one ratio so this crystal would look something like this on the uh, atomic level. It'd be millions and millions or billions and billions of the uh, orange sodium ions and billions and billions of the blue chloride ions, but they have to be in a one-to-one -one ratio because the only way to make octet configurations is by having that one electron from one sodium transfer into the empty spot in the outer shell of the chloride. Now, because the crystal is really Na1 billion, Cl1 billion, we don't wanna say that formula. So what they do is they just simplify whatever the actual crystal is down to its simple whole number ratio. So we call that the empirical formula. So when you talk about ionic compounds, you're not gonna talk about the actual number of ions that are bonding together in a little salt cube, which would be like Na1 billion, Cl1 billion. You just go, what's the simplest ratio? And so we give the simplest ratio as the formula for sodium chloride, which would be one Na with one Cl. And so we say the empirical formula is NaCl, okay? <clears throat> now, that may not have been incredibly impressive to you. Now, okay, well, okay, sodium chloride's formula can be predicted just from Abegg's theory. How about something a little bit more challenging? Let's pick another combination of a metal and a non-metal that might bond together. How about something like calcium fluoride, okay? What would Abegg's theory predict would be the formula for calcium fluoride? Well, let's go to the periodic table and look up the number of valence electrons for a calcium atom and a fluoride atom, fluorine atom. Calcium is in the second column on the periodic table. That means it has two valence electrons. Why did I put the two dots together? Why didn't I put one dot on the left and one dot on the right? Why is that? Yes, orbital fills first. Exactly right. So you're not going to miss that on the test, are you? No. Good. A fluorine atom has seven valence electrons. It's in the same column as chlorine was, so it winds up looking like this. So if you want to make a compound between one calcium and one fluorine, the fluorine will attract one of the electrons from the calcium and it'll fill that one spot in its outer shell. But you see what the problem is? the calcium is not stable yet. It still has one electron. That one electron still has a very low ionization energy. So that means calcium fluoride, Abeg predicted, 
would not be CAF, that would be impossible. That calcium needs to get rid of its second electron. How does it do that? What do you think? Add another fluorine atom. It has to react with a second fluorine atom. And so then the electron in the calcium can now go to the other fluorine. And now the calcium has finally reached an octet. It's lost two electrons, so it's positive two. But you've needed two fluorides or two fluorines to take those two electrons away. This predicts the empirical formula of this crystal ionic compound. It would be CaF2. And lo and behold, when we decompose calcium fluoride and we analyze it experimentally for what its empirical formula is, we get CaF2. So people went, oh my gosh, maybe this octet stuff is right. And maybe metals are really losing their valence electrons to make positive ions and non-metals are gaining their electrons to make negative ions. Now, another way you can actually show that's true as well, and we're gonna actually do this in, oh, you're gonna probably watch a video actually, but we, we would do this in Chem 1A in a lab later, is if you take something like calcium fluoride and you dissolve it in water, if it really is made of ions, you're gonna have ions floating around in the solution. And you know what a solution can do if it has ions floating around in it? Conduct electricity. That's how we know it's actually made of ions, exactly right. Now, if you take sugar and you dissolve sugar in water and test to see if it conducts, it doesn't. So sugar is not an ionic compound. It doesn't produce ions that ionically bond together. So that's something else we'll talk about later. But we can tell from other experimental work that this is, must be true, this is verified, he predicted, I bet you're gonna get ions and when we test the solution's conductivity, they conduct electricity, okay? Um, professor, I have a question. Go for it. So like for like sugar, a type of sugar, for example, C6H12O6, mm -hmm. that's the empirical formula? No, you, well- it, You no. divide it, right? So when we get to bonding between non-metal atoms, what we usually do is because they form these little units is we actually tell the exact number of atoms of each element the bond to make a single unit. And so sugar C6H12O6 is saying there's actually 24 atoms bonding together to make this little unit that we call a molecule. The empirical formula for sugar would actually be C1H2O1, right? Because you okay. divide by six. So That's for, what I was asking. And then yeah. what would you call, like C if you did, if they're the same thing, what's the, it's not empirical formula, it's something else, molecular right? Formula. Molecular formula, okay. Because covalent bonding makes molecules. So ionic bonding does not. If we go back for a second, this, there's no picture of one unit up here. There's a calcium ion and there's two fluorides. They just happen to stick together because they're oppositely charged. But when nonmetals bond, they actually form little units. And these units are called molecules. And so if we want to tell how many atoms there are in the actual molecule, we give it some molecular formula. And that's commonly what we do. But see, there is no molecule here. The one calcium is not stuck to those two fluorides to make an individual unit because if you dissolve this in water, those three ions just separate from each other. They really aren't a coherent unit. They just happen to attract because they're oppositely charged. So whenever we have ionic compounds made of metals and nonmetals, we always express them as an empirical formula. But in a few minutes, when we get to covalently bonded compounds, because they form these unique little units that actually do stick together, we call those molecules and we give them a molecular formula. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. So you're going to want to be able to represent ionic bonding by using electron dot notations. And there's a fancy name for this. It's called Lewis structures, which we'll discuss just before the period ends. So how do you represent ionic bonding with electron dot notations? Well, if I give you a compound that you would predict would have ionic bonding, we call that an ionic compound. How do you know if something has ionic bonding? Because the compound has metals and nonmetals in it. So this has potassium, which is a metal. And if you don't, you know, know these by heart per se, then you just have to look at the periodic table and go, oh, potassium's way over on the left, and then uh, nitrogen's way over on the right. So that's a metal with a nonmetal. So if it's an ionic compound, that means the compound's really made of ions. So if you're gonna show its Lewis or its electron dot notation representation, you've gotta show me potassium ions and nitrogen ions. The mistake people would do is they would just write the dot notations for the atoms, because we can tell that from the periodic table, right? Potassium is one dot, and there happen to be three of them, so I could draw three potassium atoms. And nitrogen's in the 15th column, which means five valence electrons, 
first two go together in the S sublevel, and then the three other ones go in unpaired p orbitals like this. So I've written all the atoms that will eventually make potassium nitride, the compound K3N, but this is not the uh, electron dot representation of the compound because I'm not showing ions. So what you have to do is you have to move the electrons where they go. The metals lose their outer shell electron and the nonmetals gain them. So if we take those three different potassium electrons, we know potassiums will lose their valence shell and move them over onto the nitrogen. Can you see how that perfectly fits into the three empty spots in nitrogen's outer shell? So this is not the correct representation for an ionic compound. It would be three potassium ions. They've each lost their valence electron. And those three electrons are now added to the five that the nitrogen had. And you wind up having a negative three ion like this. And that would be the correct uh, electron dot representation for this compound. Make sense? You're not going to see homework on this until after you take your next test, but uh, you definitely will first homework 2A for the second unit. Draw me a electron dot representation of an ionic compound. Okay. <clears throat> now the last type of bonding we're going to talk about is bonding between non-metals. How do non-metals bond? If carbon and hydrogen and oxygen bond together to form sugar. We know they don't form ions because as we just said, we dissolve sugar in water, we test the conductivity, there's no ions there. So they're not doing ionic bonding. So the person that first recognized the type of bonding that occurs between nonmetals was Gilbert Newton Lewis, who I tell you, it looks exactly like Colonel Potter from MASH. I don't know, doesn't he? Do you remember that show? Did you ever used to watch that sometimes on like MeTV or something? Look at that. Is that him or what? Oh Pretty much. God, I believe it. That's uncanny. I used to watch that all the time. Oh my God. This is him, isn't it? Look at that. Oh my gosh. Okay. Kind of. I think so. Well, yeah. My wife thinks I see a lot of things that really aren't true, but that's okay. So what Lewis proposed was that what non-metal atoms do is they don't give up their electrons. They share their electrons until they achieve an electron configuration of a noble gas. <clears throat> Now, why would this make some sense? Well, nonmetals have very exothermic electron affinities. That means they have a strong attraction for electrons. So if you put two nonmetal atoms together, they both have attractions for electrons. Nobody's going to give it up. So they have to share, and that's what happens. So Lewis said, I'll tell you why. When you look at that chlorine gas that you saw in lab, and that whole flask was filled with that yellowish greenish gas, right? And you were told that that's not chlorine atoms, that's millions and millions of diatomic chlorine molecules. I'll tell you why it's diatomic chlorine molecules. Because those chlorine atoms are reactive when they don't have a complete outer shell. Chlorines have seven valence electrons. So if you create a chlorine atom inside the flask and somewhere else has another chlorine atom, eventually these chlorine atoms are gonna bump into each other. And when they do, they're gonna wind up sharing those two unpaired electrons. And if the two dots in the middle, the two electrons there are considered being shared, they're counted for the left atom, which makes 2468. They're counted for the right atom, which makes 2468. Both atoms get noble gas configurations. And what Lewis did in his notations is if you shared a pair of electrons, he erased the two dots and replaced it with a dash. So you think of that dash as two electrons and this arrangement says that both atoms now have noble gas configurations. They don't do it by transferring electrons. They do it by sharing electrons. And when you show the sharing of electrons with dashes from Lewis, from electron dot notations, we call these structures after Gilbert Newton Lewis, Lewis structures. So it's a representation of chemical bonding using electron dot notation. That's what Lewis structures are. <clears throat> So in the example that we did, we have the two chlorine atoms. The dash means they're sharing a pair of electrons. We call that the bonding pair. That stands for two electrons that are bonding. I've colored it in red here. That's a bonding pair. Now the chlorine in its outer shells have a whole bunch of extra electrons around there. I've colored them in green now, right? Those are not used for bonding. Those are just electrons that happen to be in the outer shell of the chlorine atoms. It's just they're not involved in bonding. We call those lone pairs, okay? So when you're looking at a Lewis structure, the dash represents the bonding electrons and the pairs of dots represent the lone pairs. 
why would this actually be more stable than two individual chlorine atoms? Let me tell you why. If you pull those two atoms apart from each other, think about the single unpaired electron. Let me go back a second, even to this. Yeah, it wouldn't be octet, I guess. It, that's true, but see, that's just because you know this magical word octet. I want to give you an actual physics region. I understand. This electron here is attracting to how many nuclei? Just one. This electron here is attracting to how many nuclei? One as well. Now, the top electron is attracting to how many nuclei? Two. Bonus nucleus, right? This one's attracting to two nuclei. When you make atoms bond, the bonding electrons now get to experience the attraction of two different nuclei. That means they have a lower energy state. So bonding actually causes two individual chlorine atoms to have a lower energy state because a pair of the electrons now get to attract to a pair of nuclei. This is why bonding favors uh, how el elements exist as opposed to staying individually. It's really nice it's making an octet, and that was really good of Lewis to recognize that. But in actuality, the physics of this is the energy state of that molecule is lower now because the electrons are experiencing more attraction, okay? And that attraction we call a covalent bond. And it's the electrostatic attraction of those two shared electrons, what we write, draw the dash for, to the nuclei of the bonding atoms on either side of it. So it's the electrostatic attraction of the shared electrons, that's the dash, to the nuclei of the bonding nonmetal atoms. <clears throat> and so now getting back a little bit to what Ms. Quickly talked about before, that causes these two chlorine atoms now to make a unit. You can't pull them apart. They now move around as that unit. And so these little units here of atoms that are covalently bonded together have a name. And a little unit of covalently bonded atoms is called a molecule. So covalent bonding forms individual units called molecules. And the molecules bonded together with covalent bonds, but one molecule does not bond to another molecule. They just weakly attract each other. So when you create something that's a, a compound of nonmetals, you have covalent bonds. They create units like molecules. Cl2 is a molecule, C6H12O6 is a molecule. These molecules then pile together and you can actually like for sugar, make a sugar crystal, right? I want you to think about the difference between a sugar crystal and a salt crystal. This will be important. In a salt crystal, positive ion, negative ion, positive ion, negative ion, positive ion, negative ion, everybody attracts everybody else really strongly with ionic bonds. You know how, how, how high you have to heat the temperature of salt to make it melt? Any idea? Think you could put salt on your uh, stove and crank up the heat as high as you can get and melt salt. I don't mean dissolve in water. I just put solid salt on a frying pan then blast your 50,000 BTU burner. Think you're gonna get that to melt? Doesn't yeah. it have to be hotter than glass? It has to be 800 degrees Celsius. So you're not gonna get that to happen. Can you put sugar on your uh, skillet and turn on the heat and melt it? Yes. Yes, because the sugar molecules don't bond to each other. So what you do is you just overcome whatever this weak attractive force between it, and that's why it melts. So there's a distinct difference between uh, mo molecular matter, because they don't attract each other very strongly, and then ionic matter, where everything is attracted really strongly by ionic bonds, and that'll be important later on in the course. So, so Lewis is ionic, I guess. Say it again. Sodium is ionic, obviously. Sodium chloride is ionic. So Lewis's theory of covalent bonding can explain the formulas of substances like Cl2. It can explain the formula of water and all other groups of nonmetal atoms to covalently bond together. And before we're done today, we're going to show you how you come up with a Lewis structure for a covalently bonded compound. And this is going to be a skill that we're going to use over and over and over again this entire second unit. Okay? So you may have done, drawn Lewis structures before. You may have your own little way to do it. And I used to have a different way. But after all these years, I've sort of settled on, I actually gave up. I had this way. I thought it was so wonderful. But 
this way that our book talks about really is just the best way to do it. So I'm going to teach you probably the simplest way to draw the correct Lewis structures. If you have some other way you love, it's probably going to be fine, but this will wind up taking you the least amount of time and the least amount of racing, etc. So in order to draw Lewis structures, if you want to draw a proper one for a covalently bonded species, so that means we're going to be drawing these for compounds between non-metal atoms or any combination of non-metal atoms because they're the ones that bond covalently. What you do first is you have to add up the valence electrons for all the atoms that are going to make up the particular molecule or the particular ion. <clears throat> so first add up the valence electrons for all of the atoms that are in your molecule or your ion. Second step, you're going to draw what's called a skeletal structure by using, using pairs of electrons to make bonds. You're going to draw the atoms on the paper. You're going to go dash between them, dash between them, dash between them. Those dashes are going to be the shared pairs of electrons that are the bonds. Then you're going to apply Lewis's theory. The atoms bond to make noble gas configurations. So you're going to complete the octets unless you have hydrogen in your compound. Hydrogen's outer shell is the first energy level, and that's filled with only two electrons. So hydrogens will have a noble gas configuration like helium, so they have what are called duets instead of octets. So you're going to complete octets for all the atoms except duets for hydrogen. Doing the outer atoms first, I have found that winds up giving you the least amount of hassle in drawing these Lewis structures if you do the outer atoms first by using the remaining valence electrons in the molecule. And then we're not going to get to this today. This will have to wait till next week. But if octets are not produced when you do that, you're going to have to make the atoms that have octets share more electron pairs with the atoms that do not have octets. And we'll see what that means uh, next week. But we're going to practice a couple times here today before we're done the first three steps and see if we can catch on to how you are to draw in probably the most efficient fashion the Lewis structure for a covalently bonded species, which means when non-metals bond together because non-metals form covalent bonds. Okay. So professor, yep. other than the duet exception, do we need to know any of the other exceptions like how boron usually does six or is it we're just gonna focus on octets and duets? We're gonna do this very progressively. No, how, that's not a good word to say. We're gonna do this very systematically. And so right now you know nothing about that, but you will, okay? Okay. Right. Excellent. Here we go. Let's say you have the uh, compound oxygen difluoride, formulas OF2. These are both nonmetals, so I could ask you, this could be test number two, first question, what kind of bonding is in this compound? And you would go, oh, they're both nonmetals. It must be covalent bonding. Does that make sense? Then I might say, okay, draw the Lewis structure for this. So you now want to show me how the oxygen and the fluorines are bonded covalently. So the first step we do is we add up the valence electrons in all the atoms in the molecule. An oxygen atom, 16 on the periodic table, six valence electrons. Fluorine, 17th column on the periodic table, seven valence electrons, and there's two of them, so you have to go seven and seven. So the number of valence electrons that this molecule would have would be 20. So when we're done with our Lewis structure, we better have accounted all 20 electrons. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that when you have a compound that is covalently bonded, most of the time, the very first element listed is in a central position. And then the second element listed gets bonded to that. So unless you're told otherwise, you would assume oxygen is in the middle and then two fluorines bond to the oxygen. So we're going to draw a skeletal structure, which means draw O on your paper and draw an F to the left and an F to the right or top and bottom. It doesn't matter where you do it and then put dashes between them. Those dashes represent a pair of electrons that are shared between the two close atoms, making a bond. So this is two electrons shared between this fluorine and the oxygen. It holds these two atoms together. This dash is a pair of electrons shared between the oxygen and this fluorine. It holds those two atoms together. How many electrons have I used so far in my Lewis structure? Four. <coughs> Got to get to 20. So you're going to put all the rest of the electrons in as lone pairs. And you're going to do the outer fluorines before you do the oxygen. So I'm going to start counting. I got two, four so far. So after that, I'm going to make an octet for one of my fluorines. So we have two, four, six, eight, ten. 
See how I counted that? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Go to the other outer atom. Go 12, 14, 16. Now that has an octet. And then once you have your outer atoms with octets, go to the central atom and try to make an octet out of that. So I've got 16 so far, 17, 18, 19, 20. Oh my goodness. And if it works out really nicely for you, you will have perfect octets for all the atoms. You would predict this would be the Lewis representation for oxygen difluoride. If that makes sense to you, we're going to have you do one on your own to finish up the period and finish up the week. So everybody's good. Let's give you about a minute and a half and let's see if you can draw the correct Lewis representation for nitrogen tribromide whose formula is NBr3. Don't say anything, give everybody a minute and a half to work on it and then we'll go through the answer. <clears throat> Professor, I'm assuming in the next lesson or next lecture, we're going to talk about double bonding and triple bonding. We may, if you're lucky, yeah. Yeah, we will. So if you've added up the valence electrons correctly, nitrogens have five, bromines have seven, and there's three bromines, so five and seven and seven and seven is 26. So we've got to have 26 electrons when we're done with this Lewis structure. Assume the first atom is in a central position and attach three bromines to it. Now I put one to the west, one to the east, one to the south. You could have put one to the north, east, and west. You could have put them any three spots if you want out of the four directions. It doesn't matter. They're all equivalent as long as you have three bromines bonded to the nitrogen. So I have two, four, six electrons already here. I'm going to fill the outer shells for the outer atoms first. So that's 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, all octets on the outside. Now go to the central atom, 25, 26, and that would be your Lewis representation for nitrogen tribromide. 